Okay, now that we've found the, the number of asymptotes that we have, we need to find out exactly where those asymptotes uh, really are on our plot up here. So the way you do that is you use sigma asymptotes, this is the location of the asymptote, is equal to the sum of the poles minus the sum of the zeros all over the number of poles minus the number of zeros. So this is just the asymptotes, the number of asymptotes basically. So in this case, this is going to equal 1 plus 1, because these are the values of our two zeros. You only use the real values of poles when you're doing it. You don't have to worry about the imaginary. Sorry, let me readjust focus my camera here a little bit so you can see a little better. All right, 1 plus 1 minus 0 all over 1. So this is going to be equal to 2, just like that. So we have our asymptote starting here at 2. Okay, so now that we have the asymptote, we need to figure out what angle it's at, where it's laying on the plane. So in order to do that, we do theta of the asymptote. That doesn't look like an A. Theta of the asymptote is equal to 2n plus 1 pi all over the number of poles minus the number of zeros. So again, this is the number of asymptotes. We have 2n plus 1 times pi all over 1. This is going to give us our angle. Now, what do we plug in for n? n is actually an arbitrary number that you get to use. So you can do n equals 0, 1, 2, 3. Basically, all these numbers up until you have as many angles as you do asymptotes. So in this case, we have one asymptote. We need one angle. So if we put in n equal to 0 here, <coughs> then we're going to end up with pi. So if you look at this, pi is 180 degrees from this uh, axis right here. So pi would be over there. But if you draw an asymptote over there, you're going to end up with something a little funky. So I'm going to move up a little bit and put in n equal 1. Well, that means I'm going to end up with uh, 3 pi. Okay, so the asymptote can be equal to either pi or 3 pi, but if you look at this, well, pi is right there, but then if you go around 3 pi to 3 pi, you're at the same spot. So no matter what end you get, you're going to get whatever you want. Uh, you could also do plus or minus pi, but plus or minus pi, that's just going different directions. So you're always going to get an asymptote along this axis. And it starts at 2 and goes back here. The 2 isn't really relevant in this case because... Uh, there's not really an angle to the asymptote, it's just the axis, so the point of origin doesn't really matter. So we didn't have to do sigma uh, particularly, but it's nice to have if you ever do have an asymptote that goes off at an angle. So with that, uh, going to our root locus plot and following the rules, since we have all the points plotted and we know where our asymptotes are, we can fill in the odd uh, to the left of the odd numbered uh, zeros or poles on the real axis, so one right here, we fill in to the left of it, and it's going to go on to infinity. Now, where, how do these x's go? Well, poles have to go to either a zero or to uh, an asymptote. So in this case, the x's are going to come down out here somewhere in the middle, and then they're going to split, and they're going to go to that zero and to that uh, asymptote out at infinity. And you could draw these x's as like a straight line, technically, uh, for this root locus sketch because there's you don't really know what this line is but in this case you it is in fact a curved like half semicircle so it's good to kind of make it curvy because that uh, root locus plots are type, or normally some kind of a curve or parabola uh, whenever you're combining these values unless you're going like straight to the axis or to a zero or something along those lines but it normally follows follows some kind of curve Alrighty then, so now that you have these zeros, this point, there's a few points that are interesting. There's this point, this point, and this point. These do not cross at rad 3. That's not what they are. This is just where they happen to be close to when I sketched it. This is called a break-in point because these poles are coming into the axis right here at this point. Now there's a way to find this, but in order to uh, do it, <laughs> uh, you have to get the closed loop system. Well, no, you don't have to use the closed loop. You get to use the open loop system. I'm sorry. The closed loop system is for these uh, points up here. So you use the open loop system 
uh, in order to find this point. And the way you do that is you have, <coughs> excuse me, by, you have kgh equal to, and let me check my notes real quickly here. Okay, kgh. In order to find the loops, there's a basic rule that an equation that you should have, that your professor has given you, of 1 plus kgh is equal to 0, which goes to kgh equal to negative 1. This is a basic equation, kind of comes from the way the loop is set up, uh, the closed loop system, but uh, from the denominator of the closed loop system. But these are equations you should just have memorized. In order to find a break in or a break away point, you have to take the partial of k with respect to sigma. And this sigma is different from this sigma, so don't get confused. But what you do in order to get the k value that you're taking the derivative of, you use this equation right here, kgh is equal to negative 1. In this case, we have kgh all up here, all set and ready to go. So we have k times 4 times s, all over s squared, Let me, so you can see this, minus 2s plus 4. And that's just what this equation was. This is this transfer function, basically, and taking out the k to the side, kgh, right there. This has to equal negative 1. Okay, so now we want to separate k. So k is equal to negative 1, all over 4s, over s squared, yada, yada, yada. And if you solve that out, then you end up with negative s squared plus 2s minus 4 all over 4s. And to simplify this a little more, I'm going to take this equal to negative 1 4s plus 1 half minus s to the negative first. Now this is something that's differentiable. We can take the partial with respect to sigma. Well, what is sigma? Well, actually, sigma is just uh, the s's in this case. So sigma plus one half minus s over sigma, just like that. These are how you set up the sigma. They're just a replacement for s. Now, if you take the derivative of that partial of k with respect to sigma, you'll end up with negative one fourth plus zero. Oops, plus zero plus one sigma minus two because negative, negative positive, right there. So this is our value right here. Now moving on to a new sheet. Finish this out. You end up with <coughs> negative, or no, one-fourth, positive one-fourth. I'm going to take a step here. One-fourth is equal to one over sigma squared. And this is just by taking the one-fourth onto the other side of the equal sign. Because this delta k delta sigma has to equal to zero. Because if you're finding the point of intersection, you're finding where this value goes to zero. So the real axis is the zero uh, axis. So it has to equal zero. Okay. So then one fourth. And then if you solve that out just a little bit further, you'll find sigma is equal to plus or minus two. So that gets us sigma, which is great, but we still haven't found out what the break in or break away point is. So in order to do that, <coughs> we have to take this and put it all the way back into the equation because this is the value, this is the sigma where x where k touches the axis, but now we have to figure out what exactly that is for the location. So putting sigma back in, we have k is equal to negative minus 2 squared plus 2 of minus 2. We're going to use minus 2 first. Minus 4 all over 4 times minus 2. Alrighty, and if you solve that out, you end up with k equal to minus 4, minus 4, minus 4, all over minus 8, which is equal to 3 over 2 is equal to k. Now, right here, you see you got a positive 3 halves. Uh, that's not going to work on the real axis because we can see right here that our break in point is back here in the negative side. So we know that it's not uh, negative plus. Uh, negative 2, but it's actually plus 2. So this is going to be negative 3 halves where k comes in. 
And that's how you kind of choose which one of these is. It's basically where it's going to fall on your plot, which one is going to make your plot true. Because your plot, after you sketch it, this is basically set in stone. It's not going to come in, break in over here, and then somehow asymptotically jump over here or have a disconnect or something like that. This is where your break-in point has to be. So we just found out our break-in point is at negative three halves. Negative three halves is a spot right here. Okay, so now, what if we want to find out where it crosses the J omega axis? Well, to do that, what you have to do is a rough design with a rough table. And the way you design with a rough table is you go back to your system and you solve this uh, loop system algebraically. So you do k g over 1 plus k g or g h. And you solve this out just like you would normally. Block diagram reduction. You should know how to do this. And if you do that, what you'll end up is with is a denominator, denominator equal to s squared plus 4k minus 2s plus 4. And you can see how that would work if you just took this and put it into gh, kgh, all over this, and so on and so forth. And it, it's pretty quick and easy. It's not too darn bad, but I don't want to show it right here because it's pretty good. All right, so making a round table from this denominator, we have s squared, s1, and s0. So s squared 1 is equal to 1, and then 4, and then I've got 4k minus 2, 0. And then down here, I could do a matrix, but since I see a 0 in the lower right-hand corner, I know it's automatically going to be 4, which is the upper right-hand corner. You should, that's a pretty neat trick you can use. If you want to see it, you can watch one of my other videos. Already, which is equal to k. So I've got 4k minus 2 is equal to 0. In order to create a row of zeros, a row of zeros means something on the j omega axis. Uh, so this is going to equal 4k equal to 2. So k is equal to 1 half. So that's the gain where you will cross the j omega axis, but we still do not have the absolute position. So now, in order to find the absolute position, you have to take the even polynomial where this was used, in this case the s squared up here. So we have s squared plus 4 is equal to 0. So s squared is equal to negative 4. So f is equal to plus minus 2j. This is the location of the poles on the j omega axis where k is equal to one half. And if this was a higher order system, again, you would try to make the row of zeros and you would take the smaller system. So if we have an s cubed up here, whatever it is, you would still take s squared because that's where the j omega axis occurs. So k is an extra bit of information, which is nice, but it's not necessary to find a position. You can just set up the route table and say, okay, well in the s squared system, I'm gonna have the row of zeros and just go ahead and go straight to this equation. So looking at your Ralph, it's becoming a plot now. Uh, this is going to be equal to 2 up here at this point. Which, so this is actually going to go up a little bit higher and come in if you were to actually plot it correctly. So that's how you find the break of, uh, the actual poles of this, where the system crosses the geomega axis.